Awesome. All right. My slides are four to three. That's my issue that, that they are smaller. It's not a technical issue. Everything's fine. Um, yeah, hi. It's nice to be speaking in front of people again. Um, also quite exciting. So I will talk to you about Lurk. Oh, my slides moved. I can take over now. Uh, let's see. Yes, that works. Um, hi, I'm Hannes, Johannes Kröger from Hamburg, Germany. I work at Rare Group. We are a medium-sized GIS shop in Germany doing yeah, FOSS GIS development, consulting, training, and so on. Um, and yeah, I'm a developer, expert, and trainer as well. I'm also super professional, so I'm on GitHub as Kannes and Catacalypse on Twitter. Um, and that's it for the introduction and advertisement for us. The rough agenda for today, um, well, I want to talk about some, comp some compression algorithms, so it's quite nerdy. Um, I will briefly talk about what is raster data again, how and why we want to compress it, and then go into this LERC or LERC algorithm. I try to explain how it works, how it performs, and then try to give you some conclusions, and we will see how that works out in the end. Right, so raster data. Um, I guess you all know raster data, right? It's usually some kind of an image, or you could also think of a table as some kind of raster data. Um, here I put some random values between 0 and 50, just put them in some square, 5 by 5. It's kind of a matrix. So yeah, that's a raster image. That's a raster data set, right? We could add some geo-referencing, geo so we could turn it into a geospatial raster by just saying where there's some, um, where we need some kind of um, geo-referenced point in that raster, where is this located, site lengths, rotations, and so on, and then we have a normal geo-spatial raster data set. You know them, for example, if you have some terrain elevations or wind speeds or aerial imagery. These are all raster data sets usually, or in many cases at least, and you probably know they get quite big, so it's always a good idea to compress them. Right, there might be geotiffs, JPEGs, whatever. I made some funny German flowchart sometime um, and said, yes, you should always compress your rasters. Let's just quickly go through it. So if you have some data where your actual values are important, right, if you want to, if you imagine a zip file, you want to zip a text and it comes out with missing text, it's not good, right? So for geodata, you also need sometimes the exact values. If you still need them, you need to, or you should, compress your data losslessly, right? You don't want any information loss. But if your data is something that's usually looked at more visually, so the exact, really super exact values are not important, yeah, just use some lossy compression. What I just want to say is always use compression. It makes sense. Um, that's the main gist of this. If you want to compress, um, there are several, several choices for algorithms. And now it gets more nerdy and nerdy as the time goes on. Um, I won't go into too much detail here. Don't worry. Um, pretty much the most common, it's okay, I will use it, um, pretty much the most common algorithm um, family or LZ based algorithms, whatever that means. The idea is here that some algorithm looks through your data and tries to find reoccurring values. So if the value 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 appears and the rest are here and here and here and here, it will say, oh, I found it four times, let's just store it once and make a reference to these other times. And by that, it compresses your data. There are several algorithms for that. Some are old, some are new, some are fast, some are slow, some compress better, some less good. Um, but yeah, there are lossless algorithms. You can use them in GDAL, for example. And yeah, they have different kind of applications. In the end, that standard is a nice algorithm. It's fast, it's quite effective. But yeah, that's something that existed already for a long time. There's other algorithms like uh, RLE-based, so run-length encoding-based algorithms. I'll come to that later. There the idea is if you have a chain of characters like 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, you say, hey, it's 10 times a 1, right? You don't write 10 ones. You just say 10 times 1. Much easier. Again, it's a compression immediately. These algorithms usually look at the data really stupidly. They don't know about spatial relationships. They don't know that it's a 2D or even 4D or whatever D um, data set maybe. So they just look at the linear row or the uh, se sequence of values, which yeah, works well, but it might, 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 it might work better if they were smart about spatial relationships. 
Of course, there's lots of other algorithms like JPEG, WebP, some wavelet-based ones, and so on, which work completely differently, but I want to compare to Lurk and these other algorithms or rather the competitors to that Lurk algorithm. That's enough for some rough and basic jump into raster data, right? It's some values and some kind of metrics. We want to compress it, and there are already several um, algorithms that exist, and now there's a new algorithm. LURK stands for Limited Error Raster Compression. So raster compression, it's compression for raster data. And this limited error means that there's a controlled loss. So we as a user can decide, oh yes, please compress this, please, you're also allowed to lose some data, but please keep it accurate up to this decimal number. So like, please keep the centimeters, but throw away the nanometers. That's the idea in LURK. And if you say, oh no, uh, you might not introduce any error, it's lossless in the end. Lurk is fast. Lurk works for any data type, so you can use bytes, you, you can use integers, you can use float values. And the main idea was to use it for floating point, a high bitrate floating point data. And it's processing the data in 2D chunks, right? So it knows about um, the neighbors on the other line if you look at it like a book. Lurk was developed by the well-known and beloved uh, Environmental Systems Research Institute. You might know them as ESRI. Um, I'm not from ESRI. Um, luckily, they recently open source. It's patented, but it's under the Apache license, so we can use it in our open source projects perfectly fine. It's not incubated in OSGEO, but it's in, um, yeah, on the website as well. And thanks to GDAL, it's also available in all our tools, at least if you use GDAL, which many do, of course, Q QGIS and so on. And you can use it in GeoTIFF, for example, or in the meta raster format. It's an older algorithm. I think in ArcMap it's available for 10 years, but now uh, it came into GDAL in the last, I think, two years. So it's quite new, and I thought, it's interesting. Let's make a presentation on it. I'm not affiliated. I'm not paid by S3. Um, I'm just here because I like this kind of stuff. Lots of sources, it's complicated, and the last line is important, right? I just tried to figure out how it works. I read the patent, I read some documentation, which is so-so. Um, I'm not a super programmer or something, so I might not have gotten some things correctly. Um, in doubt, just uh, look into it, or if there's uh, additions or corrections, you're welcome to notice them after the talk. But let's look into how it does work, because I found it quite interesting. It's a new kind of idea to compress this kind of data. So in the first step, Lurk can look at the raster file and um, it tries to use these spatial relationships. So it tries to find areas with low variance, like if it was elevation data, if you have a lake or flat plain, right, all the values are pretty similar if it was elevation data. You might have mountains and ridges, and there the variance would be quite high. Um, Lurk uses let later, and so it tries to look at the raster and kind of divide it into areas that are already kind of similar to each other, and then store, for example, um, a big lake in one big block. These blocks are then looked at independently, and Lurk tries to find out how I can compress the bytes in this block perfectly. If you know GeoTIFF, these are not GeoTIFF tiles. That's one step ahead. For Lurk, each tile is kind of a raster data set. So let's look at one of these blocks, basically. Um, this is a 4 by 4 block, right? So 4 pixels, in the, uh, 4 by 4 pixels, or values, rather. They are all around 1,200 uh, <laughs> 1, uh, units. Let's just say it's terrain elevation, so it's meters. And let's say we don't care about the, about the millimeters, we just want an accuracy of centimeters, so we actually have two decimals too many here, right? We could throw them away, it would be fine, we could still work with it. You also see some empty M cells, we might look at them later if I manage it on time, maybe not. So in the first step, as I said, Lurk looks at one of these blocks. It already tried to find blocks that are pretty similar, and now it tries to make the data storage needed for these um, values as, as small as possible. In the first step, it looks at the minimum value. It tries to find a value that it can use to then 
subtract from all the others, which we'll see in a moment. Just remember here, it's like four um, numbers before the dot, four behind the dot. We find the minimal value, and now we can subtract that value from all the other values. So the value itself becomes zero, and the other values became quite small already. Quite, they are now relative to each other. Um, and already we seek some kind of impression, uh, compression, if you want to think about it. We can just restore the values by adding the value again, um, so it's a reversible operation. This is nothing special. This is done in many other algorithms as well, but now comes the magic of lurk. Um, let's say we said that there might be an error of plus minus one centimeter, so there's an error of 0 0.01. Lurk now takes these values and applies some formula. It divides them by two times the maximum error, whatever. Um, there's some math behind it. Um, you see that the, the uh, values change again. They become quite big, but it's just an intermediate step, so it doesn't matter. In the next step, Lurk uses these values and rounds them to the next integer. And this is the magic inside this algorithm. Um, I can't explain it well. You just have to believe me, uh, right? This is the step where there's a loss inside. And because before we divided by this maximum error and we now round to the next highest integer, um, we introduce this loss. And now we have integer values, which is important. Before we had floating point numbers. And if you know computers, these numbers can take a lot of space. Integers are kind of easier to handle. And that's the next step that will follow. Um, the numbers are big, but that's not an issue. Now we, become, now we become computers, so we look at the numbers like they were binary, zeros and ones. And maybe you see already, right, there's lots of zero, 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 and then come some ones. Um, if we talk like Germans, I could say, hey, you owe me zero, 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 one, two euros, and you would give me 12 euros, right? The zeros are redundant, we don't need that. Um, but computers are kind of weird. They store their data in bytes, and there's, well, some uh, byte alignments and so on. So in this case, we have like 32 bits, so it's stored like that. Maybe we can throw away, maybe we can, we can throw away the, the, the zeros. Wow, English. Um, and that's now possible because um, we turned it to integer values. We can now look at these values and try to find out how many zeros can we throw away from each of them? How many leading zeros are really redundant and un unnecessary for us? And for that, we check for the biggest number, right? The biggest number needs the most bits in space. So we find out it's the one at the left column. You can also check in the binary view again. So you see it's like 12 characters, if you want to look at that, or 12 bits. And all the zeros in front of that, we don't need them. We can just clip them away, and you see the slide got much uh, fainter, there's a lot, uh, less data on it, and now we are happy. So first we made the values relative, then we introduced this magic lossy function, then we got integers, and then we could throw away stuff that wasn't needed anymore. And that is now just put together into one big string of bits, and then we are done, basically. If we look at the step before we threw away the zeros, this could be like the representation of this block, so almost half the slide. Um, after this magic step, we just have uh, way fewer ones and zeros. I tried to make it a bit visual. And we got about 40% of the original just by applying this step-by-step -step process to this. Yeah, so yay, we have compressed our data. <laughs> yeah, that's basically it. Um, there's lots of more to it, of course, um, right? This, there's this nice idea to somehow divide by this max error and then round up and then throw away the unnecessary zeros, um, but that's basically the idea that's used here. Um, yeah, there's lots on top. Um, Lurk has like three versions, four versions, I'm not sure. So they do lots of other stuff as well to make it more optimal, to find the optimal blocks and so on. Um, but basically, that's it. So what does it look like? Uh, let's skip this because I don't have the time set here. I made a very, very high compression 
on this example, right? So the left side is some um, elevation data, uncompressed, and on the right side, I made a very, very um, compressed version of it. I said, like, you can make it to 10 meters of accuracy. I don't care how it looks like. I don't care how bad it is. Just to look at what happens, actually. And you see there's some kind of plateaus, right? There's fewer values, fewer distinct values. And you might also see some kind of small blocks in some corners like this here, some square areas. Basically, Lurk tried to look at these blocks and in these blocks adjust the values so they are kind of similar to each other. And if I say, yeah, you can throw, throw away a lot of information, it makes them very similar, so you get artifacts like these. As I said, this is an extreme example. Um, you shouldn't do that. Lurk is perfect if you use it with an error that matches your data. We can also look at this in an elevation profile. So I used some um, one meter uh, cell size but centimeter elevation um, accuracy. DEM of Germany looked at some dike here on the northern coast. Um, there is a green line, but you can't see it because there's also a blue line in front of it. The blue line is at a accuracy of uh, one centimeter, so it matches the original pretty well. There's a pink line, which you probably cannot see. No, maybe a bit. It's like 10 centimeters, but I also made a line at, or a compression at one meters of um, accuracy. And you see these plateaus again, right? So you need to be really, you need to be really careful with your data if you want to do some hydrology or something like that. You should use a value that matches, of course, the needed precision of your data. Again, don't look at this and think look is bad. I just made these to show you really what happens in the background. Right, um, you can't talk about uh, algorithms without um, looking at benchmarks. Um, I managed to not do any more benchmarks. I look, just looked up other people's benchmarks and did one small one. Um, as we of course, course did some to show how great Lurk is. It's six years old, they only compare to LZV, so a very basic algorithm. Um, it's very fast Lurk, um, it's even faster than LZV in some, some, to, um, some points. And it can be smaller than even this basic algorithms in some um, some examples. Coco Alberti did some nice um, uh, um, benchmarks in his um, article on GeoTIFF compression. And mostly he said, yeah, it's nice, try it, use it, it's fast, and make it makes your files very small. And then there's a very nice uh, blog by, on GPXZIO, which is also not only for the Lurk um, example, it's very useful. Um, he also did a very recent um, benchmark and also came to the conclusion that, yeah, Lurk is a very good competitor to the other algorithms. Um, so yeah, check it out, try it, and definitely use it if you have some data that is in a very high precision, precision like yeah, float 32, float 64, so you have, I don't know, femto meters if it was um, elevation. Lurk works very well in that case if you say, it's okay if I take millimeters, I don't need the rest. Yeah, my tests were a bit varied. Um, I just included one here. So I just used GDAL, standard levels, predictors, um, all the usual stuff. And I took two data sets and used Lurk at the actual precision of the data. Um, I had some DEM of Hamburg, um, which is a precision of about one centimeter. And you can see at the bottom here, I used an error rate of half a centimeter, so it was allowed to um, jump in that precision. And I just listed the size. I didn't care about the speeds here. I just wanted to make the smallest files available. And you can see in this case, Lurk easily won. It made the file very small, smaller than deflate, smaller than Z-standard. So a very nice um, example here. You can also apply extra compression on top of that um, if you want. That's a detail. The other example is some Landsat scene, so byte data. Um, which is, has a precision of one, if you want to look at that, right? It's just um, RGB bands um, between zero and 255. And even there, Lurk is not far away from the others, so there's not that much compression going on, or that much difference between the algorithms, but Lurk is just there with the others. So yeah, it's not something you should ignore, you should try it and have fun with it. Right, that's basically it. Um, a quote from Esri, right? You need to do, the, do your own benchmarks. You need to test your data on your own. Um, I tell you, try it, so try it. Um, it's a nice thing. 
All right. This was quick. That was com uh, complicated. There was lots of numbers um, inside. I hope it was interesting. Um, my conclusion was it's an interesting algorithm. Um, it's worthy trying to use it. Um, you can play around with it. It would be great if the documentation was better. And yeah, if someone's sitting here and saying, oh, that was totally wrong, please correct me right now, right? I'm not here to be right. I want to share some ideas and stuff. So don't be afraid to not ask questions, but also add corrections. And that's it. Thank you very much.